Hello, fellow human beings. So yeah, uh, 2020 certainly was a uh, year, huh? Do do fuck copyright it is so shit. Do 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 fuck copyright it is so shit. Do do. You think with everything happening right now, there wouldn't be actually a lot of films coming out? Like why would there? Cinemas are closed. Nearly everywhere, basically. But there's actually a lot of good output put out there on, well, the bad output in this list. I have conducted my usual year-end list, and they're both pretty stacked. I have conducted what I consider to be a release at a certain amount of year in another video, and other blogs and stuff. I'll, I'll spare you. With all that said, let's just go right into the list. Who's left this here? Matthew? Please don't leave it Maybe. in the window. It looks Just awful. Just well, what somebody it. did. No, but they're the kitchen. I'm not do doing it. I'm not doing it. how this works. So the uh, concept is you just can't yes, use that. Uh, when they're using cash. I know, but I don't understand how the machine works. To Just write, write it all, it all down. down. Write it all down. The Great British Bake Off has become kind of an institution for uh, the UK and has been had huge international success on top of that. So a movie about baking, about the art of bakery, about showing the different cakes and treats and stuff like that, that's kind of a no-brainer. It's just a pity then that this uh, movie is dark, both literally is in the line really bad, and in terms of the subject matter where we're talking about a woman whose life is tragically cut short while her family tried to fulfill her dreams. Fun, cheery stuff. I haven't actually watched The Great British Bake Off, but I, I, I got the impression that people liked it because it's light and fluffy and very entertaining and very charming in that kind of way, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a lot of dark existential dread during it. You can correct me one way or the other if you see fit. A lot of the things that bother me about this one, it seems to be more of a personal preference. And that's why it's so long on the list. It's not terribly made. It's not unprofessionally made. It's just dour. There's way too many necessary subplots. Oh, these rich people are really trying to run a business in one of the most wealthy areas in the entirety of London. Ooh, tension. We have to get this dour, miserable grandmother from her acrobatic millions or something. There's nothing really wrong with the filmmaking per se. I just think there's a lot wrong with the heart of it and that's why it's on my list. Well, uh, the robots attacked this talking dog and a gangly dude that had this habit of using the word like at the start of every sentence. Oh, that's Scoob and Shaggy, all right. So what happened? I don't know. They seem pretty bummed out. I guess their friends dumped them in a cold-hearted way or something. The idea of a Hannah Barbera shared universe is not that unprecedented. Like, they've crossed over before and done kind of stuff together. It's where we're just kind of doing a Marvel-style cinematic universe, complete with the fact that this isn't a Scooby-Doo movie. It's a Dynamite movie. It's about his conflict with the Blue Falcon, trying to amend that. It's kind of where the meat of the story technically is. And Scooby-Doo and Shaggy are just kind of along for the ride and have their own bullshit going on. It's not a mystery. It's, it's, it's just a kind of superhero style film, but like, nobody's fucking tuning in for a goddamn Dynamite movie, are they? So here we are. Shaggy and Scooby are intensely annoying here. The animation is really off-putting and kind of ugly. It doesn't really fit the style of humor that we're expecting from this. It feels a bit too jarring. Most of the cast don't really work, except for Frank Welker, who reprises his role as Scooby-Doo. Well, it's Fred, strangely enough. It's a kind of dull run around where we're globe hopping because Marvel. Uh. The only thing that really works here is Dick Dastardly actually. And I uh, I don't really like his minion style fucking henchmen, whatever, they're extremely annoying. But his actual motivation for what he's doing is really compelling and it's really uh it's really sympathetic. The problem is like the thing I care about the most is the villain when I'm not I'm not really supposed to. The rest of the mystery scene cast don't have anything to do. It's way too self-aware, way too self-consciously trying to kind of pick at the Scooby-Doo mythos, which doesn't really work here, and it's very cynical. I don't think it, it fits what they're trying to do with this or what they're trying to achieve. I finished a binge watch of uh, Supernatural recently. I finished the entire series, and... Uh, please, sir. And... If their crossover with Scooby-Doo respects them more than a Scooby-Doo movie does, yeah, you yeah, kind of fail in making a fucking Scooby-Doo movie, guys. Seriously. Anybody sitting here? Yeah. My imaginary friend. 
can joke about that here. People actually have them. So obvious job all the way. I'm bad. You made a bad. I didn't mean to. Undo it. Undo it. I talked about this movie briefly when I was doing an X Men retrospective, going through the Fox X Men film, and that was more about the, the series as a whole rather than this film specifically. But after like the eighty four year delay on this getting released and the reshoots and the no reshoots and all the stupid drama behind the scenes towards this film, at the end of the day, it's just not really worth anything. Characters are really uninspired. It's It's got this creepy kind of dull deadness to it. There's nobody else in this hospital besides these kids and their ward and it's really unsettling. They don't really explain why this is really. It's dumb. Most of the cast are trying, especially Maisie Williams, but it doesn't really sell, save. Well, from two thirds of it, nothing is really happening and then the turn of it is just kind of this dumb conflict. They kind of build up but then it just kind of comes right the fuck out of nowhere and I have no investment in what's happening. Conflict is confused and really obvious from the get-go. It takes way too long to get going, which really affects how bad the pacing is here. Most of the characters are dull and or just extremely unlikable when they don't need to be. There's some weird racial stuff with Ileana's character that never really gets resolved. We're just supposed to accept her being a racist asshat as part of the character I guess. There's some bad CGI and some ill-defined powers because we need to reference the comics as much as possible folks. Reference the comics. The cinematography is really lacking. The score does little to make this come alive. Whatever vision the director had it just ended this series on an insanely dull note. Honestly most of it is just bland and really uninspired but the fact that it kind of shits on the legacy of one of the pillars of what started a superhero boom, that's especially why it's on my shit list. What a poor end to a really important franchise. Hello there. The Grand Orleans Imperial Island Hotel welcomes you and your lovely group of benefactresses. Uh, I would just like to say that we applaud your innumerable uh, philanthropic act. Robert Zemeckis' output of late has been more kind of what spectacle he can get out of the story. So him doing a role Dal adaptation, it feels almost inevitable at this point. Uh, what the problem here is, is that not only are the effects not really that good, it fails to capture Dal kind of off kilter anarchical spirit. So uh, what we're left with is something, the worst sin you could ever put to this legendary children's author. It's really ordinary. And Hathaway is really trying, and she has one of the very few decent effects in the film. Honestly, I think the marketing should not have given that away. But mostly, this is just a really dull kind of runaround with uh, really uninspired kid characters that we're focused on for most of it. The hotel setting is really dead, and that's where most of the film takes place. It's where the book takes place. It captures none of the spirit that's in the book, even with its limited setting. There's not great acting here, great talent, just completely put to waste. They have nothing really to do. This is not just Chris Rock voiceover throughout most of it. I don't want to compare this to the Rogue film because I think this movie fails on its own. You don't need to have seen it to realise why this movie is not good. But I think that film manages to capture Dahl's anarchical tone by staying in this limited setting, whereas this is sadly not replicated 30 years later. What state is this? Sorry. You don't understand the question? Oh, no, I didn't. Just... Most people know where they are. <laughs> Why ain't most people? You're in the glorious state of Arkansas. Absolutely dismal all over the place sat political satire that was surprisingly condemned by Trump and the Republican Party when it seems to go out of their way to portray them as the morally righteous ones in this scenario because damn the liberals do not come off very well in this. It kind of fails to get across whatever point it's trying to make It's because it's got some really bizarre structure and there's this really obnoxious gag they do near the start where um, they keep on killing off who the main character you think it is and it's like oh okay that, that's kind of clever but it's like the fourth time you've done it so please stop stop being funny. It, I, I, I get it. I get it for being clever. Please. Just, just just, show us a character, show me a story, please. Like, even ignoring the political stuff, it's just not a very well-made film. Most of the characters are very ill-defined and not very likeable. It doesn't really have any good uh, scares or trills or um, violent moments, at least from my own 
perspective. It's just very uncompelling and dull for most of it. It is could not get into into anything. It was trying to hit. It's mostly just kind of flat, ugly, and really cynical. I mean, there's not not an interesting message behind this. Don't be so quick to judge people. Don't make yourself worse than the enemies you are trying to uh, combat. Don't turn yourself into a monster in order to defeat your opponents who you feel are the monsters, in speaking broad strokes, honestly. Uh, it's it's all sent just crap, of course, and not the most uh, compelling message at the moment, now that I think about it. I actually wrote this a couple of days ago, and, and thinking about it now, holy shit. But I mean, the point is, there's, there's a message there, but the movie is just kind of sloppy and unfocused enough to get across this point in a cohesive manner. Or they don't actually give a crap and they're using populist political rhetoric to do the most deadly game trope and get asses in seats. Either one is not great. I'm hoping it's the former. But still, it does not make this movie any good or really worth recommending. For everyone's sake, you know what you're doing. And now we're one step back and... I am trying to protect this family. Oh boy, an Irish film. That's also a very low-budget one, so I'm going to feel doubly guilty about shitting on it. This is an extremely dull and yet really hyperbolic melodrama about a woman who is stuck in her family home as her parents and her siblings uh, force an intervention. It just kind of played out like that. Like, most of the characters here are either extremely unlikable or just too one note to really give a shit about. And don't get me wrong, there's some great melodrama to get out of characters you do not like, but there has to be something that you want to connect with them. It's just boring trope after boring trope. Oh, it's the cynical, corrupt politician. It's the hyper-focused businesswoman who doesn't care about who she tramples. It, and they have the deep, dark secrets that come out one by one by one. It gets more and more ridiculous every single time. So this is like the second or third film I put on a list that's kind of hyper locked into one location. I, I don't hate kind of locked room or locked location kind of things. It's actually great for budget saving, but there's nothing here that makes this um, house or the field around it or the country even remotely visually interesting or compelling to look at. It's actually shot in a really flat way where it's underlit to get across the moodiness of it rather than to make these shots even remotely interesting or to tell a story in their own way. Also, the editing is just really choppy and terrible where I'm pretty convinced they cut a scene out and then very hastily chopped around it to make sense because it's like information given in one point where it clearly feels like there was a moment being said here but they either didn't have time to shoot it or it came out bad so they just cut around it entirely. I feel this kind of family melodrama does have its place but there's nothing in here that makes it stand out. You don't feel like Santa claustrophobia that you need for what they're trying to get across. That's just disappointing and you know this this movie is just kind of flat and dull and this line really works towards it. Sorry. Oh, what helps with cramps? Sex. <laughs> the craft is a staple in 90s baby got discovery films and I really enjoyed it. It was right up my alley at the age I was when I saw it. But I, I wasn't enamored enough with it for me to be annoyed by the 40 Young People reboot of it. I mean, in this kind of depth of completely lacking original ideas from Hollywood, a reboot that doesn't just try to subconsciously dab at the original and to do its own thing, sort of, uh, it seems to be the best we can hope for. And then I watched it absolutely dead on arrival direction with no sense of flair no sense of trying to build us into this world the characters are boring and flat as hell outside of the main girl the four leads have no personality whatsoever and the acting is unilaterally terrible the story goes in a really obvious direction i think what they're trying to make a statement or something but for the most part it just feels like it's desperately trying to bait for a sequel which Considering the reception to this, I don't think is happening even with the desperate ending they do. It tries so desperately to be modern and hip. Yes, it's a prequel which came out 25 years ago. It's going to age so much better than this one is. Fuck it. Uh, we're here for the special. What of you? Oh no, just my buddy here. 
his eyes. Hey, uh, I'm Jerry. Best sex of your life. So I'm not against the monster as metaphor kind of horror story. I mean, as you could tell from the clip earlier, I'm a Buffy fan. It'd be weird if I wasn't into that kind of shit. It's my jam, yo. If it's done this ham-fistedly and really awkwardly and incredibly over the top in a way that doesn't coherently fit in a decent narrative, it kind of loses me. And I hate being harsh on low-budget films. Like, every movie is a mini-miracle. And I can say every person who has worked on that film has worked way harder than I am doing these lists. But the budget is not the issue here. It's stiff acting, boring, terrible characters, and a plot that goes from 7 to 90 in the space of a minute. The only... The only... The only saving grace in this entire film is the third act and some really cool effects, especially for the money that you must, that they've spent on this. But I don't think good effects are enough to salvage a flat movie for two thirds of it, where you just hate the main character and pretty much everyone around him, and I, there's no consistent flow with where the story goes. I'm not going to watch a film just because you tell me the final third is worth watching, especially nowadays where you could probably just find it on YouTube. I don't know if you find this film on YouTube, but still, it ain't worth the time commitment, guys. Don't bother. <laughs> Great horror can make you discover fears you weren't sure you really had, but when the basis of your horror film is the scary version of Dick in a Box. I'm not going to be that invested. Sorry. Can you tell me a little about the behandling? I can understand how I can explain my methods. So, Burners, of course, are great, especially in horror films. Also, just realized that three horror films in a row. That's kind of weird. But when all you have is tension and no compelling characters, kind of cohesive narrative or really a story at all, a point to it. It's just endless cynical misery and the payoff is really going to be good. And in case you didn't guess because of its placement on this list, payoff is not really worth sitting through this. And I can kind of see the point that this movie is going towards, but most of it is just the locations are flat and super generic. It's a lot of torture porn shit that doesn't feel that impactful or compelling. I don't really know or care about any of these characters or the situation they're in. It just has this bursting female subjugation angle plastered onto it. It doesn't really compel and go anywhere or say anything that in depth outside of just being plastered on kind of aesthetically speaking and I don't think this is poorly intention but there's a lot of miserly flatness you have to get through in order to get to a pretty weak if bloody payoff not worth the time or emotional commitment I don't know you don't know <laughs> you gotta have something you're thankful for you gotta come up with something why it is Thanksgiving that's what we do well not technically a horror but the horror in a different kind of way. I'm not sure what kind of avant-garde acting kick Tom Hardy is on between this and Venom. I'm kind of here for the ride. His performances aren't really good or bad. They're just kind of a bizarre trip. It's like watching your friend on MDMA recite Shakespeare as his jaw is about to shut involuntarily. So I'm focusing a lot on Hardy here because outside of him, this movie is just bad. And it's bad in some really obvious ways. I don't really get what's meant to be captured or evoked from this film. It's just a series of scenes banged together as we watch Capone during the last few weeks of his life as he's dying of syphilis and it's beginning to affect his mental state. It's about his legacy, uh, the effects of the illness on his mental and physical health his family, how caged he was by the end of his life, being one of the most celebrated gangsters of the 20th century. All of that, none of that, I don't really care because this movie is just ugly, both in the kind of way the cinematography plays out because this film is gaudy as shit, but also in the gross stuff they make the phone do. And I'm pretty sure that they seem to only do this to get a reaction out of you. I don't really think it has much of a narrative cohesion. It's just watching Tom Hardy shit his pants because that's gross and they got Tom Hardy. Well, I think he literally shot his pants, but still, I mean, he might have. He's very mad at the moment, I think. Maybe there's a gem of an idea there. And maybe director Josh Trank 
has a lot of feelings about feeling trapped in a situation where people are throwing money at you at a facility of freedom, but also controlling your every action until it drives you insane. I can see why that kind of idea compels to him, but whatever he was attempting, it did not come across on screen at all. If I never see Tom Hardy recite the King of the Forest song from The Wizard of Oz as Al Capone, I will live a long, happy life. Mi papá también es de, de Ciudad Juárez. This one almost exclusively makes it on here because I hated the main character. Like, passionately. He's creepy, he's irritating, he has these weird fucking hang-ups, and most of all, he just has a flat-as-hell personality. If your characters are not at least somewhat engaging or compelling, I'm in for a bad time. It has a really compelling opening scene. Like, I really love the opening. But then it just kind of meanders on and on and on, and with these dumb kind of plot terms and contrivances, so eventually I just wanted it to end. There's no momentum or rhyme on this one. I feel really compelled by the plot, and it also stops dead at one point till we focus on all this other extraneous shit until we get to its weird, not kilter conclusion. I, fe I felt nothing while watching most of this, outside of annoyance. Limp and lifeless, almost from the gate, with a boring cast of characters. What kind of endings do you prefer? In books. I'm a writer, you see. Depends on the story. A grossly insulting, confused, and misguided attempt to look at mental health through the eyes of a man half remembering his life due to dementia while his daughter takes care of him. Harry Bardem is trying, but there's not much in the material to really give him any impact. And he's almost laughable in places. And I don't really think any of the actors come out of this looking good. Laura Linney manages to escape by barely being in it. It just pours on so much crap and none of it feels authentic or gets me to care about these characters in any tangible way. It just feels so contrived and a way to kind of grasp at the audience's emotional core and none of the situations that they're put through feel real. There's some battling contrivances here too, by the way. Not that looking after a parent who is extremely mentally ill, especially with dementia, is something that is supposed to be easy, but we've got another fucking movie about disability where it's just an endless dole of misery onto the caregiver, and we've seen this crap so much before. It's not really productive, and it's just dare to induce suffering and misery onto the audience. We had torture porn at one point, this is misery porn in any capacity. The flashbacks are used, confused, and rather sporadically. Considering how much they make up for the narrative, it's hard to know what their purpose is, especially giving the bizarre final shot in this. There are better and less insulting films about dementia out there. They don't try to be this artsy or disingenuously purposeful. But I know how to stop it. Oh, yeah, I do. Island's power comes from this here rock thing. It turns the water black, dripping everywhere. It can do impossible things. Bring a loved one back to life. Turn him into a black-eyed zombie like it did my daughter. A prequel to this light fantasy show from the 70s that's horror-based. It's just strange enough it to work. Like, there's something in that idea that's so deliciously gonzo that you could really feel compelled to give it a shot. And then you watch it and it's dull, obnoxious and really cliched. And you're like, oh, that's the direction they're always going with, aren't they? Let's just hit on any random property, including a TV show from 40 years ago that nobody really talks about anymore. Any brand recognition is the goal for Bloomhouse. Nothing about the cinematography feels authentic, compelling in any way, which is weird because it's a tropical island setting you you can get some decent shots out of it. But also it's just so uncreative with random arcs pulling out our ass to make this remotely compelling. It just delves into dull, tedious nonsense, and that's before you see Michael Pena do an incredibly uh, not good accent. Uh, it's a generic jump scare minute schlock fest with too much money to be really charming and way too grating to be entertaining in a mindless way. I don't know why I keep expecting so much from Bloomhouse, but eventually they're just going to pull a get out out of their ass and I'm just going to continue watching them with the hopes that one of their 90 films a year will be good.
Jessica Chastain is a fantastic actress and she's versatile as hell. She could easily play an actor in heroin. But one is kind of um, embittered and hard as nails. It doesn't really fit her mold exactly. She's great at unraveling intensity. And I think it works with stuff like Zero Dark Thirty, where she plays a woman who's kind of tough as nails, but eventually the stress of everything going on with her life kind of breaks her down. She pulled that off splendidly and um, she would definitely rob the Oscar. And I mean, maybe she is suited for this kind of action heroin role. I don't know. This movie's too terrible for me to realise it horrifically generic in any capacity. It's the same boring fucking spy or assassin or whatever comes back into their normal life and faces punishment from their group or sect or whatever because of that. Nothing happens that you do not get. I do not buy this character as a recovering drug addict. She doesn't have to be strung out or anything, but give me some impression. She's battling some demons. I mean, I don't get that at all here. Nothing in this is something you haven't seen before. It's horrifically average and not that well shot even if that's something you were going for it's boring it's way too obvious it just takes way too long for anything to happen no amount of good acting would have saved this even if it was the case it had it look i can't do this whatever you're doing i can't do it listen to me wherever you came from before here so I won't reveal the twist of this film. No, it happens already enough in it that I don't really know. It doesn't ruin the experience by knowing it from experience. It just paints this movie in a really ugly, unforeseen light because it doesn't really have any interest in exploring the implications of what it's saying. It just seems to be there for some kind of weird misery porn outlet as well as a revenge flick near the end. Uh, kind of some breeder as well, but there's a racial element here. So it's way more uncomfortable. <laughs> there's this weird sense of karmic justice to what happens to Lee. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't think this was the intention of the director's at all. But that's what happens when your movie is weirdly focused, awkward, and bullheaded in trying to get the idea across that it's really cool and creative and awesome. Most of the film is told in flashbacks, and so you don't really get the impact of what's happening in the main narrative trust of it, which is annoying because the flashback doesn't really give us a lot of information we need in order for this to have any proper impact. It just takes way too long. Well, at least we get away from the shuttle, say, reset, because they don't really do much to get the impact of how horrible this situation is. Like 12 Years a Slave, you ain't. Even if it's not trying to be, it should at least push towards what it's trying to say and get across. Nothing about this works. And I mean, at least they don't try to kind of indulge in it being miserable or showing the pain that these people are going through, which I, it is good, but also like it robs of the impact of what this is and what it's trying to say. So it just comes across as both really insulting and not impactful enough to justify the lengths they're going to to tell the story. So it just kind of fails all the way around. Tell me something. I mean, I know you've had many young women. I was just wondering why me. You're probably thinking, oh wow, you're putting a Tyler Perry movie on the list? How unpredictable and way out of nowhere. Well, it is unpredictable, because I've actually never seen a Tyler Perry directed film before this. Whether this is indicative of his other work, I can't tell. I'm going to presume the other films are shot better, because he had more than five days to work on them. What the fuck was the point of that? Just to say you did it? What I can say for this film, not for the rest of his work, it's stunningly awful in any conceivable way you could possibly think of. Everyone complains about the twist, and I mean, it's it's really bad, don't get me wrong. But everything else about this film just doesn't work. The editing is really stilted and awkward. Uh, none of the characters are that interesting. It's got this weird, ugly, mean-spirited tone that doesn't really work for the narrative and just makes you hate every single person, nearly every single person involved in this, and just wanting this all to and every bad decision here just snowballs with crazy incompetence right from the opening with the suicide at the beginning which doesn't really set the tone of this film at all and considering where it does end up it's just kind of ugly and uncomfortable in a way that isn't really interesting or saying anything just a bad movie made for bad penny pinching reasons there's that weird ugly filter on the flashbacks and every character is just hilariously over the top and how miserable they are i know i already made the point of this i cannot stress just how much misery is induced 
in this fucking movie. Severely mismanaged and badly taught out. All these ingredients make a perfect clusterfuck. Gardner <laughs> Jr.'s post-star career has certainly set people a buzz. Maybe not as much of a buzz as the behind-the-scenes stuff about this film. Seriously, go look it up. It sounds kind of insane and like the worst possible shoot. With all the kind of hype settled down now and everyone buzz is kind of moved on and people have mostly forgotten about this film. Looking at it now, it's it's just terrible in a way that's dull and really forgettable and also awkward and amazingly uncomfortable in ways you will never really quite put your grasp onto. God, those animals do not look like they are actually there. And I mean, they're not there, but the point of CG is that they're supposed to, you know, look like they're there. And you I'm, I'm just gonna move on. So much went wrong here. Robert Downey Jr. just feels so uh, morose and standoffish. His usual boundless energy and uh, charm and wit just kind of completely thrown out the gate. And maybe that was the intent, but it does not make this really uh, worth sitting through. His arc is not good enough to justify you casting Robert Downey Jr. in this part and not have him act as himself, or really as what everyone loves about him. It's not whimsical, it's not fun, it's not adventurous. It has one of the strangest and bizarre endings to any movie I've seen, possibly all year. Like, I, I, I can somewhat try to get what it's going for, but also I, I, I do not at all. Like, what? <laughs> Everything around this project just crashed and burned, and that is... That is fucking apparent when you see it on the screen. Hopefully this isn't apportioned for its star's future career moving forward. But we shall see. It's so great to see you! You smell so good. What is that? Just to get this out there from the top, this movie has two sexual assault jokes directed at men that are meant to be comedic and at the expense of the one being assaulted. But it's okay, because he's a guy. Fuck this movie. I did not think you could find both the manic and also comatose energy of Adam Sander, and yet find somebody who is less charming and more obnoxious than he is. Get you fucking got there by dividing into two with David Spade and Lauren Lapkus. Hope I'm pronouncing it right, I apologize if I didn't. The only thing more fascinating than the complete lack of chemistry these two have is how boorish and mean-spirited their dynamic is. Spade is pretty bad here, but it's Lapkus who takes the cake in one of the most annoying main characters, obnoxiously great and unlikable I've seen all year, bar none. Every time she is on screen, it is a chore to watch this. It also seems to be pulling that um, Sander trick of I'm going to set a film in a tropical location to get the studio to foot the bill, from me and my mates go on a holiday. And I mean, if I had their money, I'd probably push out crap like that too, just to get a paid vacation. It doesn't really make the movie any less unfunny and flat and cringe comedy for the most part. That doesn't really work because from what I got from cringe comedy is that you, you actually find the characters funny or did, did that they deserve what happens to them and as annoying as Spade is, I don't think he really deserves most of what happens to him in this film. Most pertinently the assault. I need to stress that again. I hate the style of humour, but I especially hate it when we take the sad slack main character who's just slubby and gets put upon throughout all this. And yet I'm supposed to give a shit by the end about their relationship and trust me, I do not. I do not give a fuck about either of these characters, especially Missy. Oh, fuck this obnoxious, grating piece of shit and fuck anyone who tries to tell, convince me that this style of comedy works or is remotely entertaining or compelling. Also Vanilla Ice is in this for some reason. Ugh, that's just one big grape. Uff, moment. So when the controversy surrounding cuties was happening, my initial thoughts were, well, I mean, there was a lot to think about mostly 
Wow, yikes. But also, man, I really hope these people don't discover the trouble of the being born. The only difference between the two of that is that the nudity in this movie is CG, but this is still depicting a 10 year old actor as a cyborg replacement for this, car this guy's dead daughter. And it's implied they have a sexual relationship and it's squeaky and uncomfortable and on top of that this movie is mostly really bad. In case you're wondering, Cuties is neither on this list or the best list. Pretentious voiceover and some with and I don't think the I mean I don't think this is the fault of the actress. She's a child, but she's just not very interesting in how she presents the voiceover. It's not that compelling. But it's also just this really benign, obvious look into our relationship with technology and the creepy implications behind it as it evolves. And it just reminds me of a Black Mirror episode, as in it literally reminds me of the episode with Hayley Atwell and Donald Gleason from season two, which is much better and gets its points across way more coherently and confidently than this film does in way less of the time. So watch that instead. The structure is really sloppy where we just kind of go into a different film near the midpoint or just past the midpoint. And again, it's two locations that aren't very shot in interesting ways. I mean, mostly they do cut away a good bit, but it's mostly stuck on these two houses and apartment and this kind of villa, villa or something. It's just pretentiously written, exploring these topics in a way that it feels like the horrific stuff that they are looking at and, and implicating is just more there for shock value and getting across this idea that we have a disturbing relationship with the technology we possess rather than telling a story in an interesting and compelling fashion. And I don't think it's worth bringing up these topics, even if you CG it in. And also I will never be clean. So to preface this, I have never actually read the Office Foul books. I had heard of them, obviously, but I didn't know much about them until, in fact, I didn't really know the plot of the first book until this film came out. So I had no, absolutely no investment in this series whatsoever. Although I did hear about what the first book actually is and hearing the plot of it, holy shit, that sounds way more interesting than what we got. I'm prefacing all of this by saying, regardless of how I feel about the changes they made and how it goes away from the book, this film is still terrible. Like, it's it's one of the worst blockbusters, and it was meant to be a blockbuster. They had to push it on to Disney Plus because of the pandemic. And, I mean, it probably was for the best, because imagine sitting through this in the cinemas with your kids. Absolutely zero drive or forward momentum for the plot. I honestly thought it was just about this get going, and then the movie stopped and ended. That was the climax, not the point where we compelled in the plot. It's bizarre structure and I think the lead is also really bad in this. I, I don't blame the kid, I actually feel bad for him, um, it just seems like he doesn't give a lot of compelling direction but he's in most of the films so I think it's worth pointing out. And there's just so many bad ways the story told, the media res opening, how terribly the fairies plot angle is set up, how none of the characters seem remotely compelled or motivated to do whatever it is they're doing in this. And there's just really bad world building as well. It's one of those films that's setting up for a series, rather than making the first film good, so you'd have an excuse to make sequels. It's so strange. I, I, I hate when movies do this. There's no significant, strong, compelling character development. Nothing about this is fun or exciting or really gets you into this story and these characters and where we're supposed to go from here. I just, I don't give a shit at all throughout the entire runtime. I can't imagine how bored kids would have been through this. It's probably a blessing in disguise for your wallet that this was not playing in cinemas, but for the sake of entertainment in this form, it's probably not a great sign overall. I guess this is what happens when it takes nearly 15 years or more, actually about 20 years, I think. I don't, this, this movie has terrible pre-production history. You know what the best thing I can say about this movie is? I saw it early. I saw it before the pandemic started in January and I did not see a movie for the rest of the year as terrible 
as the turning. Like, it's funny to think about this film after The Haunting of Blind Manor came out, which is loosely based on the same story. And that one's just kind of blown out of the water. Like, I haven't seen it, but everyone talks about it to the point where this film has been completely forgotten about. And rightfully slow. Painfully dull. Painfully slow. No compelling characterization. No compelling acting. I mean, The Stranger Kid... The Stranger Kid things. The Stranger Things Kid is good in other things, but the Stranger Things Kid is not good in this. It's also set in the early 90s, and like they, they make a point to preface that this is around the time that Kirk Cobain committed suicide, and I still do not know what the purpose of this is. They don't do much with the period setting in like the design or anything to make it compellingly set in this time period or make you believe it's in this time period. No tension. No sense of atmosphere. The kids aren't really developed in a creepy and unnerving way. Like, you think they would, given the premise, but what really makes this not work is the ending. This has got to be one of the worst movie endings I have ever seen, period. It's a really insulting depiction of mental health, and it has this kind of weird classist undertone that kind of just got under my skin. Like, for a lot of classic stories like this, especially ones based around aristocracy, where you're adapting into modern times, it's really easy to mess that up and to come across as really unintentionally and lovable. And man, does this movie do that in spades. Warped, weird, strange, and all around shockingly planned true. I have seen some pretty terrible films in 2020, 21 of them to be precise, and none of them have annoyed me or confused me or mystified me or pissed me off as much as The Turning. The worst film of 2020, well fucking deserved on that as well. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,